This is a story of creation and a fall. This is a story of a calling. This is a story of slavery. disobedience and hope. This is a story of death and of life. This is a story of empowerment to go and tell. This is the story of redemption and restoration. This is God's story. There's a story unfolding all around us. It's a story we're all a part of. It is the story upon which all other stories rest. In fact, this story makes sense of all other stories. It is the greatest story ever told, filled to the edges with the greatest news ever imagined. It's a story in which life, joy, and hope are at stake, now and forever. It explains our deepest longings and our highest hopes. It's a story that tells us who we are and who we will be. We have answered God's call to plant the Well Community Church in San Antonio, partnering with other gospel-centered churches to bring citywide renewal through the gospel. The Well will engage the city of San Antonio with the gospel of Jesus, invite all people to know the person of Jesus, unite all people to the work of Jesus, and unleash all people to share the story of Jesus. This story continues today in the beautiful, unique, and culture-filled city of San Antonio. It is filled with excitement and comfort around every corner. San Antonio is a beautiful place to live and work, yet the city is also a broken city, filled with busy people seeking fulfillment and finding identity in everything except the God who created them. Amidst the beauty, creativity, diversity, and passion of San Antonio, Less than 7% of the 2.7 million people here identify themselves as evangelical Christians. Added to that, many residents dismiss the idea of the God of Scripture being King and Creator. Most have skewed perceptions about Jesus and the church. Others have been deeply hurt in church context and therefore are suspicious of the gospel message. There is a great need for gospel-centered churches to take root within many neighborhoods in the city of San Antonio. Good morning, Vintage family. My name is Rob. I get to serve as a lead pastor of Vintage Church. I'm currently out of town right now, journeying with the saints up in Seattle, but I am completely pumped up to introduce to you one of my best friends in all the world. His name is Jonathan Griffin. We know him as Griff or Pastor Griff. Griff and his wife, Amanda, came to New Orleans to study, to prepare. We trained them up. They're one of our interns. They launched some new works for us. And then we sent them out to San Antonio to plant a new work called The Well. And they're blowing up. God's doing some amazing things. They've seen people baptized. They're gathering now in a new space that God has given to them. So I'm excited to introduce to you uh, Pastor Griff. We're talking about Jesus' work. And Pastor Brick is also going to be coming in this gathering as we're celebrating all that Jesus is doing, not here in New Orleans only, but also around the world. And he's going to share with you about our global partners in Southeast Asia and in Mumbai, India. We're so thankful for all that's going on. So you guys know how we welcome and introduce people and how
how we encourage people. Everybody stand up right now. Yeah, I'm talking to you in the back row. Everybody stand up and y'all give it up for Pastor Griff, thanking God for what he has done with us and what he's doing in San Antonio and around the world. We love you, Griff. Let's give it up. Who that? Please, please, please be seated. My heart is so full. My heart is so absolutely overjoyed uh, to meet so many new faces, but also to be here truly with family. I've, met, I've been a part of uh, so many of your homes. I've eaten so much of your food, as you can see, and uh, I have been just so so excited about coming here and sharing with you guys. Thank you so much for what you're doing uh, through the Well Community Church as a partner here. Um, and we are so, man, just overjoyed to be a part of uh, what God is doing through Vintage Church at the Well Community Church. And so uh, what I want to do is just very plainly direct us to Jesus' work in the scripture. And that's going to point us very, uh, very quickly, I guess, to uh, what God is doing, not only here, but really what he's doing every place around this world. Um, and we're going to get to hear, I'm so excited about uh, uh, the Mumbai trip that Pastor Brick is going to come and share about. And, um, but, but without further delay, if you'll listen quickly, I've got a lot of ground to cover. So uh, let's get to John chapter 11. You'll kind of be on screen here and there. It's going to pop out. Uh, we're going to go really, really fast. I'm going to attempt to cover uh, verses 1 through 44 in a grand total of 15 minutes. So uh, I'll need you to listen very, very, very quickly, okay? So uh, it says this in John chapter 11, verses 1 through 2. I'm not going to read everything in entirety, so please forgive me, uh, especially with context. I'm just going to kind of give you the overall narrative of what God's doing through this story because our story together is so, so beautiful. And, and I want you to see that God is truly active not only in the life of the scripture, but he's active in your life. He's active in the life of this church and what God is doing through, um, through each and every one of you. No matter if you feel like God is really moving through you or not, I pray that through this scripture, you will see very evidently God is at work. He is at work today. He, is at work. he was at work yesterday. He is at work continually all throughout this entire, uh, really, this globe. And so uh, go with me here really quickly. Um, verse 1, it says, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of, of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent him out, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard of it, he said, the illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Okay, I want to pause there for, very, for a little quick moment. I just want to articulate to you and maybe also remind me that the work of God, the, the work of Jesus, as, as you guys have been so gracious in giving and loving and even coming along and serving alongside uh, us at the Well Community Church, God is using you, he's using us not for our glory, right? Don't get it twisted at all. Like, don't, don't stop for a minute and think that, man, this is all about us, right? You know, look at what we got done, you know? That band, right? If you're up here at all, if you were out there and you weren't just doing one of these, or I don't know, we had some, we had a little dance session going on up front. We had different things, hands were being raised. You think if, if for a moment, if you think that that was about these guys, you're wrong, Right? So, so if you think for a moment that, that anything that you are doing, if, we, if, if we're engaged in any act of service toward God or, or for God or with Vintage Church, as you have given so generously and as you have given sacrificially to the Well Community Church down in San Antonio, which we thank you so much for attempting to, to, to just give out of your own tithes, offerings, whatever it is, thank you so much for giving to us. It was for the glory of God. And for the good of this city and for the good of, the, of cities around the world so that they may come to know Jesus. So very plainly, if we look together, if we were reminded the work of Jesus, the work of Jesus here in this place, in this city, at Vintage Church and everywhere across is for the glory of God. Let's not forget that, okay? You guys with me on that? This means yes. Y'all can talk back. This is really good. It's good for my soul. I got it good in the morning. Here we go. Yeah, like, here we go. Uh, it says this, then in verses five and six. So we already know, right? The story goes like this. There's a sick man, his name's Lazarus, right? And if you hear, let's just all pretend we've only heard this story once, okay? Maybe you've heard it 1,500 times, but let's pretend we're reading this together for the very first time. We now know, based off of what we see in scripture, that dude, someone's sick, and it's someone that Jesus loves. It's a man that Jesus loves. He cares for him deeply. And there's this, this chick who wiped her tears with, on his feet and put an ointment on it, okay? 
Weird, I know, right? But you can find that probably in Luke. But I would think, and I think you would agree, if someone comes and wipes their tears with their hair on your feet, that's, that's a pretty friendly setting. You with me on that? Yeah, so that we're there together. They, they, they know, hey man, like, they, they know, like, I'm not together. You guys with me on that? But anyway, uh, you know, they, they know of one another. They're intimately, they, they're friends, man. They, he's done something in her life. You can find that in Luke 7, what happened and what goes on there. But, but really, these are friends of Jesus. And this is what happens in verse five, right? Now, Jesus did what? Loved Martha and her sister Mary and Lazarus, okay? Now, Jesus loved them, okay? Verse six. So because he loved them, right? So it starts, so because he loved them, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer. What? Right? I love you. You're dying. You've sent word, Miles, to come and, for me to come and see this beloved person that is ill. Because I love you, I'm going to chill here for two days. Doesn't make any sense. It's to display this point. Look here. Jesus, Jesus loves you. Right? Nobody's blown right now. Nothing's going on right here. Okay, why did we bring this guy in, right? Why did we send him out, right? Okay, very plainly, uh, we could have probably sent a four-year-old out, could have done the same thing, right? Hey, Jesus loves you. The work of Jesus, the work of Jesus, and Jesus at work in your life and in my life and the lives of others across the globe, everywhere we look, in San Antonio at the Well, here at Vintage Church, all around this city, Jesus loves you. He loved us so greatly, John 3, 16, right? We know he loved us so greatly. God loved us so greatly. He sent his only son and Jesus willingly, he went to the cross for our sins. It was hurtful. It was painful. He didn't, at the very end, he was going, God, if there's any other way we can do this, if there's any other way we can be separated from this thing, if, there, if I can accomplish this task any other way, then let it be. But if not, let your will be done, not my will. And he goes to the cross for your and my sins. And I need to remind you today, this very statement is that Jesus really, he, man, he loves you. If you're sitting here today and you're going, man, I, I, don't, I, I don't know what God's doing. I don't even know why I ended up here, but I want you to, to know from the heart of, of us at the Well Community Church, from the heart as a vintage partner here in, in New Orleans, I want you to know, man, Jesus cares for you. He went to the cross for you and he's at work today. He's at work maybe even in your very own heart. You've never been told, man, Jesus, Jesus cares for me. And listen here, if you be a Christian today, a follower of Christ, or if you be a Christian today and you're sitting in this chair, I want you to know something. I want you to hear something, okay? Jesus loved these women, this, these women and this man, Lazarus, so much. He loved him so much that he stayed for two days. Listen to me. It doesn't always work out the way you want it. You with me on that? It doesn't always look pristine. It doesn't look always packaged. Because, oh, Jesus doesn't love me because I didn't get X. Y, Z. Jesus could not possibly love me because this hurts so bad. Jesus couldn't possibly care for me because look what I did not receive in the moment that I needed it the most. So I'm here to remind you that very plainly that the work of Jesus sometimes does not match up with our very own timing. But Jesus loves you. He cares for you. And man, he is good. He will continue to be good because he has a plan. Right, so we don't know what that plan is, right? We're pretending, we're all pretending. We don't know what's about to go down here, but we know that there's a man who is sick and Jesus didn't come. Why? Because, man, even at their own request, even at their own desire, even at what they wanted right in that moment, he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna delay because it's for my glory to be shown on this earth. So to you, follower of Christ, I just, I just remind you that the work of Jesus, if you're going to be involved in it, if you're going to be involved in the work of Jesus, sometimes there will be a delay and you may not even know why. He's not, he's not sitting here giving you every single detail of every plan, every moment, right? I detail out in my life the way that it played out for me. I was sitting uh, where you're sitting in this community, in this fellowship of believers that I, that I loved, that I cared for. Right, my wife and I, were, we found our deepest friends here in New Orleans. We, we were married and, and uh, man, it was, we did our first few years of marriage here in New Orleans. 
We loved, I love you, I still love you. We still, I mean, we constantly go, man, and it's not just the food, it really is you guys. You guys with me on that? Like, I, I, we, it's not just about the food, it's about you guys, right? Um, we, we really do deeply love you. And Jesus said, go to San Antonio. I said, no, I refuse. Get thee behind me, right? right? Uh, which you can't say to Jesus, but anyway. So, like, uh, you know, I, I just said, no, it's not gonna happen. And, and, and he said, Jesus, Jesus said, go, go to San Antonio. It's your hometown. This is where you were saved. I want you to go back and lead many to Christ there. I want you to lead them to me. I want you to show them the gospel. I said, but Jesus, we got a really good thing. I mean, rock and ball just went down. We just, I mean, we, we got something going. Jesus, we got something going. And I don't mean to make anything much of me. I'm saying this for the glory of God, but for the glory of God and for the good of the city of San Antonio as well as the city here in New Orleans, he moved my family to San Antonio to start a new work. And it's gone slow and it's been humiliating and it's been hard and it's been just ragged every, every single day and it's tough. But man, he is good. And I know that he's good. And I would not be, I would not rather be anywhere else Follow me here in this. We gotta skip down to 17 because we're moving pretty quick. Look down at 17. What happens is there's a big delay. Basically, he tells the disciples, hey, um, we're gonna chill here. As a matter of fact, let's go to Judea, right? And the disciples are like, what is going on? They stoned you back there. You, they're, about to, they're about to really take you out, right? You wanna go back. And, they're like, and he's like, listen, this is who I am, right? Uh, paraphrase, of course. So we move down to verse 17. It says this. Um, now, when Jesus came, right, they tell him he's going back to, he's going back to Lazarus. He's going to go see. He, he says, Lazarus has fallen asleep. You'll see that in the preceding verses. Lazarus has fallen asleep. In verse 17, he says, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb. Not dead. He doesn't mention anything, but he's already been in the tomb for days. Now we know, based off of what happens with, with uh, Mary and, and Martha here, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out and she met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Look, check this out. So what happens is we know, based off of the distinction of days, that he is dead and he is stanky. You with me on that? We know that it, we, we're about to find out that everyone's like, dude, please don't roll away the stone because it's about to get real, right? Um, so they're telling him, listen, four days, and for the Jewish, there's, uh, there's writers who say this, that the Jewish... Um, there are, there are Jews who say that um, they would wait about three days just in case the soul of a man who was dead would re-enter the body. So they'd wait for about three days to go ahead and declare this, he's dead. Why? I mean, that's their deal. I don't know what's going on there. You're going to have to read it for yourself, okay? So now we know that he's been four days. So we know according to all terms, this dude is dead. He's gone. He's absolutely dead. It smells in there. And check out what goes on. Martha, look in verse, um, look in verse 20. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, this is two miles out, she went and met him and Mary remained seated in the house. I never saw that until I was studying for this passage. Check this out. The work, Jesus is at work. This last, this last portion here. Jesus is at work. Will you move toward him or will you remain seated? You can have two responses, right? You can be bitter. You can go, Jesus, you didn't answer my prayers. I really wanted you to come down. I really wanted you to be here. I really wanted this to happen. I really had this going on. You can remain seated where you are or you can join the work of Jesus and move really close to him. You can move into him. You can ask and beg and draw near to him. We're gonna sing this song called Oceans a little later and I'm so pumped that we're gonna sing it. And it's just like this song is what we're talking about. Jesus, lead me to where my feet Lead me to depths that my feet can't wander into. Jesus, lead me to places where I can't go. Jesus, would you, would you tell me, would you show me something? Jesus, would you be near to me? Because I'm guaranteeing you this. You can either be like Martha, you can be like Mary. And I'm not talking about work or not work. I'm not talking about serving or not serving. I'm talking about will you remain seated while the work of God is going on or will you actively move toward him and get involved? Would you pick up something and do it? Because you and I, you and I both know Man, this church, Vintage Church, has been so impactful in this city. And you can sit there and you can, you can cry and gripe about, well, I didn't really like the lights. Or I didn't really, oh man, it was a, it was a touch too much today. Or you know what, I, the sound, I just, couldn't, I just couldn't get with it. That music, it was good. I mean, Robert's great and all, but man, there was just a, one song. I wish we could just, could we sing Amazing Grace? I mean, just once. Right? 
You can get all crazy. You can get all, like, like you can start thinking about, oh, well, well, I don't know about this, and I don't know about that, I don't know about this. Or you can get with the program, meaning you can get with the glory of God, seeking his glory, his name, his fame, and you can jump into the work. Because Jesus is at work. No matter what's going on, Jesus is at work. He's on his way, and Martha runs out to meet him two miles out and says, hey, listen, I'm right here. If you were here, Lazarus would have been here. He would have been dead. He would not have been dead. He would have been alive, rather. Or you can sit and sulk. We find out later that, that he tells Martha this. Um, look in verse 25, and I just want to jump down. I'm sorry, I can't cover all of it, but we're, we're running short. Look at verse 25. He says this. After Martha says, my brother, my brother is dead. And, and, and Jesus says to him, hey, listen, your brother, he's going to rise again. And her reply is, Jesus, I know that one day he will rise again because you're going to go and you're going to be crucified. You're going to be dead. You're going to be buried and you're going to rise again and he will rise with you. But I just, I'm not going to get to see him again. Okay. I'm not going to get to encounter my brother again. And he says this to her in verse 25. Look, he says, and this is the last time he reveals he is the Messiah in the book of John. He reveals it once again to the woman. First time was the woman at the well in John chapter four. The last time to a woman again, how important you women are in, in spreading the gospel and the good news. We love you. Thank you so much for doing what you're doing. That was just a momentary soapbox. Here we go. Um, verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, he shall, uh, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said what? Yes, Lord, I believe that. You are the Christ, the son of God who is coming into this world. So he still doesn't promise her, I'm raising him from the dead right now. But what he does say is, I am the resurrection and I am the life. And anybody who believes in me, he's never gonna die. Do you believe that? I'm asking you, do you believe that today? Do you believe it in this place? Do you believe it? Because the belief of something like that changes your entire perspective in life. The belief that he is coming back because you will go to work tomorrow or Cyber Monday or wherever you're going. You will go to work tomorrow and you will say, man, I believe that he is coming back. And I believe that one day when he comes back, he's taking all those who believe with him. He is bringing them into heaven and, and seating them in the, in the righteous place next to the Father. Man, we're going to be singing. We're going to be praising. We're going to do all these things. Man, and you know why that changes your belief? It changes your action. It changes, hey, this is the way I interact with other people who do not know Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is at work, and guess what? He is utilizing you and me to spread the gospel. He already says that in Matthew. He's using you and me to get involved with spreading the good news, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who do not know him. He is the resurrection. He is the life. And if you believe that, would you go out and would you say it? Would you get involved in Jesus' work? I want to say this last thing as I close. We'll drop down once again to verse 38. And what we find, if you want to read it, you can read what happens with Mary. You can see how Jesus kindly and softly brings her back to himself. And finally, if you look in verse 38 through 44, what does he do? Even in, in the midst of everything, four days dead, four days gone, he walks out and he says, man, listen, my heart is deeply moved. Jesus, the compassionate, fully God, fully human, finds compassion in his heart, finds a deep sorrow. He weeps in verse 35, he cries over these people and he says, I do not want this to be the case. He prays before the people and he does this one thing in verses 38 through 44. He raises a man who is dead to life. He speaks to the tomb, he says, roll away the stone and he speaks into that tomb and he calls him by name and he says, Lazarus, you come on out of there. And then he says this, unbind that man and let him free. I wanna to say to you today that Jesus is still at work even in this very own place. Jesus is at work. If you want to see that very thing, I'm telling you right now, he is still today resurrecting dead to life. And he's maybe even doing it in this very own place. I pray that he is. Maybe today you've walked into this place and you've known nothing about the good news of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you that now you understand that there is, there is a deadness to this life if you do not have Jesus. If you do not have Jesus, you are dead. It says that in Ephesians chapter two, verse one, and you were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you once formerly walked according to the pattern of this world, according to the, prince of the, the power of the air, right? You know that feeling and you're dead. 
You're, you're chasing after meaningless things. I want to tell you today, Jesus is still in the business of resurrecting the dead to life because in John chapter four, he, I mean, in, in Ephesians chapter two, verse four, he says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, he sent Jesus. And Jesus does the same thing today. I pray that he's resurrecting you in this very moment. If he be resurrecting you in your very heart, those dead things are coming to pass. They are, they are going into the past and your new life in Jesus Christ is being made new here today because Jesus is at work. He is at work. And I'm praying, I'm gonna pray over you right now as I close and I'm finishing up at this very moment. I'm just going to close and as I pray over you, maybe today Jesus is speaking to your heart. And he is raising you to life in this very moment. If that be you, I pray that you would find me, find somebody, find your Pastor Brick, find uh, all the, Pastor Dustin, anybody else, find somebody and say, Jesus has raised me to life today because he's at work. And don't forget it. Thank you so much for what God is doing through Vintage Church at the well. Thank you so much for your giving Thank you so much for what God is doing, but don't you forget it because I won't forget it either. It is not for your glory or for my glory, but for the glory of God and for the good of the city. Jesus, I pray now that you are raising dead to life. I pray that you are raising a dead man or a dead woman who is living in meaningless futility over and over, running back to the same dead things over and over and over again. I pray that you would bring them to life in Jesus Christ, that you would start a new a new life um, according to your word, according to your good word. You said that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, the old has gone and the new has come. And so Jesus, I pray that you bring the new life into Jesus Christ with, with, um, with someone here today. I ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.